Feminist positions on pornography currently break down into three rough categories. The most common one, at least in academia, is that pornography is an expression of male culture through which women are commodified and exploited. The liberal position combines a respect for free speech with the principle a woman's body, a woman's right, to produce a defense of pornography along the lines of I don't approve of it, but everyone has the right to consume or produce words and images. A stronger defense of pornography arises from feminists who have been labeled pro-sex or sex positive and who argue that porn has benefits for women. In this lecture, I will walk you through two liberal arguments over pornography, the silencing argument and the trafficking argument. Then, I will sketch the main points made in response by sex-positive feminists and open up the question of feminist porn. The feminist argument over pornography was originally developed in the liberal political tradition and was tied to debates about free speech. Here are the highlights of the story. Liberals in general held that expression should not be restricted unless it could be shown to be in clear violation of John Stuart Mill harm principle, according to which people should be free to act however they wish unless their actions cause harm to somebody else. A number of radical feminists in the 1970s-1980s took the view that pornography did harm, degrade and brutalize women. To this, liberals replied that the issue was too complicated to settle easily and that they had not seen enough evidence to justify taking such a drastic step as censorship required by radical feminist critics. Protecting freedom of speech was seen as the most important aim. According to some liberals, if some people, including women, decide to make a living through pornography, the state should not attempt to stop them. If some people wish to consume pornography, the state should not intervene to prevent them. What is to be prohibited, they claimed, are unequivocal acts of violence performed in the creation of pornography. What is to be censored is pornography that is obscene in some way, either because of the way it is made or because it represents things which don't belong in a decent society. Of course, this leaves open the question about who gets to decide what counts as decent depiction of sex and sexuality in modern society. Because most liberals tolerate pornography and even defend it in the name of the freedom of speech, the original debate reached an impasse. Here enters the stage a new argument. The so-called silencing argument holds that one of the harms of pornography is that it silences women. This brought about somewhat of a revival of the argument for censoring pornography because freedom of speech was at issue again. The key idea of the silencing argument is that pornography robs women of a voice. This idea had always been part of the radical feminist critiques of porn which began to appear in the late 1970s and 1980s, most notably in the works of Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon. In its current form, the silencing argument has been developed by philosopher Ray Langton. To spell out the argument, Langton draws on two assumptions. One, pornography is, among other things, a speech act. And two, speech acts comprise three parts. A locutionary act, what is said. An illocutionary act, what is done by what is said. And a perlocutionary act the effect of the action on the audience. This analysis of speech acts was introduced by philosopher of language J.L. Austin. Applying the theory of speech act, we can say that pornography does not just depict things and does not merely say something about women. It's not just a locutionary act. It does something to them it is also an elocutionary act. 
Pornography constitutes an elocutionary act of silencing women by projecting a certain image of what women are and how they behave. Anti-porn feminists argue that much pornography propagates so-called rape myth. The idea that, well, all women, at all times, whether they admit it or not, really want sex, and that their refusals of sex are not sincere or authentic. Women say no, but mean yes. If this myth is accepted and internalized, this can result in a situation where women suffer elocutionary disablement. They are free to speak words of refusal that is, to perform the locutionary act of saying no, but are debarred from performing the elocutionary act of refusing. So, the silencing performed by pornography is elocutionary in a double sense. It is an elocutionary act of silencing, and it silences women at the elocutionary level by preventing them from doing things with their words. To recap, the silencing argument makes the following claims. Pornography projects an image of women that prevents their refusals from counting as refusals. A woman can speak the words that would otherwise constitute the act of refusing sex, but if the man has internalized the rape myth, he may not interpret her as refusing at all. She may fail to secure the uptake required in order to perform the actual act of refusal. If this is what pornography does to women, then it silences them. The value of freedom of speech can be turned against the liberal opponent of censorship. The restriction of the pornographer's freedom of speech is arguably justified by the need to protect the freedom of speech of women. The question is not one of balancing the freedom of speech and some other good, like equality, but one of balancing freedom of speech against freedom of speech. So, the value of freedom of speech cannot be used as a trump card against the feminist critic of pornography because the question at issue is whose freedom should the liberal state protect? A different and some would claim stronger anti-porn argument comes from legal scholar and activist Catherine McKinnon, who claimed consistently that pornography is a form of human trafficking. Legal scholar and activist Catherine McKinnon argued that in our society, pornography is a form of violence against women. Pornography represents violence, but it also is what it represents, so it is violence. McKinnon argues that pornography is not actually a question of obscenity, but of violence, so we don't have to tolerate it or assume it is a question of people's rights to express themselves or to enjoy themselves. The core of McKinnon's argument is that pornography is more like human trafficking than it is like freedom of speech. The people who are involved in pornography are almost always, in some ways, coerced. They are also, almost always, the victims of much deeper structural injustices, inequalities and latent violence. If pornography is a form of violence and the state has the duty of protecting all its citizens against all acts of violence, then there are other laws than the obscenity laws that are more pertinent for dealing with pornography. Trafficking laws, according to McKinnon, should also be applied in dealing with pornography. This is because Trafficking laws are meant to protect human beings against being moved around, exploited and coerced against their will. Trafficking laws are designed to liberate the victims or the oppressed, not to protect the rights of the people who are holding them and exploiting them. McKinnon's argument remains controversial. 
It says that pornography should be treated as a form of human trafficking, and as such, liberal societies should do everything in their power to outlaw it, to ban it. She argues that if the liberal state does not intervene in this way, it leaves its citizens, in this case the majority of them being women, unprotected. The radical feminist critique of pornography that we just surveyed remains the strongest analysis of sexually explicit material available, yet it tends to be marginalized in contemporary feminist debates. The pro-sex feminist contends that pornography benefits women, both personally and politically. Some of the suggested personal benefits include 1. Pornography provides sexual information on at least three levels. It gives a general overview of sexual possibilities to women. It allows women to safely experience sexual alternatives and satisfy a healthy sexual curiosity. The idea is that the world is a dangerous place, but pornography allows women to experiment in the privacy of their own bedrooms. And it provides a different form of information than textbooks or discussion. It offers the emotional information that comes only from experiencing something either directly or vicariously. Another advantage highlighted by pro-sex feminists in discussions about pornography is that pornography strips away the emotional confusion that often surrounds real-world sex. They say that pornography allows women to enjoy scenes and situations that would be taboo to them in real life. Finally, they point out that pornography breaks cultural and political stereotypes so that each woman can interpret sex for herself. Anti-feminists would tell women to be ashamed of their appetites and urges. Pornography tells them to accept and enjoy them. Pornography provides reassurance and eliminates shame. It says to women, you are not alone in your fantasies and deepest, darkest desires. Right there on the screen are others who feel the same urges and are so confident that they flaunt them. It is also pointed out sometimes that pornography can be good therapy. Pornography provides a sexual outlet for those who, for whatever reason, have no sexual partner. Couples can also use pornography to enhance their relationships. Sometimes they do so on their own, watching videos and exploring their reactions together. Sometimes the couple go to a sex therapist who advises them to use pornography as a way of opening up communication on sex. Sex positive feminists also point out that pornography benefits women politically in at least two ways. Alongside liberals, they argue that pornography can be seen as free speech applied to the sexual real. Pornography, along with all other forms of sexual heresy, such as homosexuality, should have the same legal protection as political heresy. This protection is especially important to women whose sexuality has been controlled by censorship through the centuries. In addition, they say that a more important argument is that legitimizing pornography would protect women sex workers who are stigmatized by our society. They argue that anti-pornography feminists are actually undermining the safety of sex workers when they treat them as indoctrinated women. The law cannot eliminate pornography, they say, any more than it has been able to stamp prostitution. But making pornography illegal will further alienate and endanger women sex workers. Sex-positive feminists endorse forms of pornography that are produced under the banner of feminist porn. They point out that the stories we tell about sex matter, not just because they give form to our fantasies, but because they can help us question and remold the real-world inequalities that replicate themselves as sexual fantasies. These feminists believe that because of its popularity, as well as its intimate nature, porn offers important opportunities for challenging racism, sexism, ableism, classism, and exploitation more generally. And for disseminating ideas about women, the body, the sex, and for teaching the art of human intimacy. While it is true that new pornographic films that fall under the general banner of feminist porn encompass a variety of sexual practices and challenge entrenched racial stereotypes, is this enough to make it feminist? Or could this more inclusive porn just be adding new bodies to objectify and demean? Some feel strongly that feminist porn is possible because they claim it's about agency. 
Feminist porn, they say, isn't about good or bad pleasures, but a larger political fight. Not simply to expand the definitions of sexuality, but to append the moral judgments altogether. Can we reconcile these defenses of pornography with early radical feminist critiques of the industry and of the way it shapes its users' erotic tastes? I want to leave this question open for your consideration.